Okay, Deborah. So for somebody who's never heard of osteoarthritis before, um, how would you describe it and, and what exactly is it? So osteoarthritis is a condition which affects a joint and which affects a function of the joint because it's a, it's a, it's a condition which degenerate, which leads to some form of degeneration of some of the structures in the joints. So the cartilage which covers the joint is beginning to break down slowly and then it stopped being functional. So it stopped providing cushioning for the, for the actual joint and allowing that smooth movement. So when the cartilage deteriorates, then you could almost say that the bones are closer together they begin to almost rub each other because the fluid which separates them is not, um, it sort of diminishes. And the joints start functioning and putting too much stress on surrounding tissue. So people will experience pain in the surrounding tissue. So if you take a knee joint into account, people might start feeling pain in the ligaments in the, um, um, in the joints, in tendons in the joints. Some of the muscles will be um, strained because they will have to work harder because they will almost have to compensate for that loss of function of that cushioning of the joint and maybe a little bit of a fluid. So osteoarthritis in itself, it's a more of a sort of wearing condition as opposed to some other form of arthritis which are driven by more inflammation but in situation of flare-ups, osteoarthritis can also be driven by inflammation. So if you allow the surrounding muscles to become weaker, surrounding joint to become painful, then you start using that joint less. So that joint becomes stiffer secondarily and, um, and it affects the way it's function. And then when you need to use that joint, sometimes you can create a bit of more extra flare-up and then that flare up, that inflammation can drive a bit of more of the generation in the joint. Right. And from the research papers that you, you, you've sent across to us and uh, the ones that we read before in the past, what would you say is the main causation? I know that we can talk about different models, such as nutrition and, and, and other factors, but um, is, the, is the one that the latest research is saying is the main driver right now? So the latest research shows that there is not a single driver. So there is, there is a group of patients who might have a genetic predisposition. So the type of cartilage that they've got may be predisposed to, the, to wear. There is a, also a group of patients who have got a very mechanically driven um, osteoarthritis. So they were injured in youth, they, the joint got injured, being an ankle joint, hip joint, or knee joint, because those are the most frequent um, joints which um, which uh, have arthritis. And that then the mechanical damage has led to some kind of change in function in the joint, and that led to stiffening, loss of planes of motions, and then the joint and the cartilage begins to wear. There is also this group of population who have got um, maybe some metabolically driven arthritis, which still leads to osteoarthritis. So nutrition is a very important factor in those patients. There is also a, quite a big group of patients who might have characteristic of all those other groups, but they lead a fairly hypokinetic lifestyle because when we're talking about osteoarthritis or any kind of joint condition, we need to mention about the process of mechanotransduction. And mechanotransduction is just a simple fact that every body, every part of your body, especially the musculoskeletal part of your body, needs gravity and load to live and to function and to regenerate and to heal even just from a day-to-day -day, um, living and moving. And cartilage is not any different, but there is a group of patients and that group is growing in some ways who lead fairly hypokinetic lifestyle. So the daily movement, daily dose of movement, daily dose of loading is not sufficient to keep that cartilage at bay. And it may be that they predisposing themselves or like sort of expressing the genetic predisposition to osteoarthritis. Because we see a different with the, um, 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 studies on twins and, and and actually shows that lifestyle has got a bearing 
whether you will progress to osteoarthritis or whether you can maintain it and maybe not progress so quickly. And is that from, you know, going back to fitness professionals, um, one of the main reasons why people who either have an onset or early stages, um, it's so important to exercise. And could you just briefly just explain the levels of, of uh, different stages of osteoarthritis and, and how you would integrate load and training into each one? So if you think about it, that if you take a knee joint from the onset of symptoms, so roughly already you need some joint degeneration, so about 20% of cartilage degeneration, to possibly the time of replacement might take around 16 years. And that's a population um, statistic. So that's not everybody. Some people will have faster, some will have long. But 16 years. So during that 16 years, your joint is losing its function. You, as a result of pain, might stop using that joint. So, which then per perpetuate the damage in the joint because you're losing that component of muscle strength and flexibility with that to really keep that, um, to keep that joint functioning and really experiencing and benefiting from that physiological process of mechanotransduction. So if you take that, so in that say, for example, 16 years of a knee degeneration, you can divide that process on sort of a four stages. And this is, this is a more arb arbitrary description for therapist and medical profession to actually understand where people are. So you've got that joint which has no arthritis and then you've got that first stage arthritis. And the normal scale which we use for, for assessing that it's called Caligran scale. And, and then you might have um, in a stage two, so the grade two Caligran, where you've got a bit of a loss of height of the joint, which may present actually functionally with a lot of loss of movement. So that joint, like if you take a knee into account, it might lose inflection, extension, rotation, that gentle abduction, and or that joint may have beginning of a stage of the generation and actually present with instability, which needs to be addressed. And the other very important things, it might already show signs of muscle atrophy. So muscle wastage because of that change of, of uh, function. Then obviously as you move on, the more cartilage degenerate, the joint loses um, um, its um, height. So the joint space loses the height, the joint loses a flu um, you know, the synovial fluid. And then you move on into the third stage of calligram. And that is very often accompanied by with a little bit of more pain, more restriction, more loss of range of motions. But still, a lot of things can be regained from that. Remember that a lot of the time when we have pain, we stop moving the joints. And that, in a way, leads to um, loss of muscle strength, loss of function, loss of proprioception, coordination, and all those important uh, factors, which are physiological factors, which are important for people to live healthy, active life. And then, obviously, in a last stage, in a, in a grade four calligram scale, the joint loses a lot of the cartilage, almost loses all its joint space, and then patients are ready for the replacement. Mm -hmm. But still, even in the replacement, and this is my own personal experience, when I worked in Canada with those patients, when they were um, um, they were waiting for three, four months for the joint to replace, the waiting list, it's longer, but once they've given a go-ahead for the surgery and a date for the surgery, they can be anything between four to, um, 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 to, uh, to, uh, to six weeks waiting time. That was the time when we used to go and take patients and really exercise them, especially in a, a water environment, and we saw considerable improvement. And what we also saw that those patients recovery post-operatively was better because they've conditioned their tissues. And what we address then is strength. But to address strength in joints which are degenerating, there you need you need to be very much aware of of things um, of things like that you need to do it very gradually. Because if you overload, if you overstress the joints, the joint can flare up those those ligaments those um, um uh, tendons can can get very irritated and a bone can get irritated so you need to do it gradually very methodically but the results are quite good mm. so 
if you're a fitness instructor or if you're working using sports therapy, really addressing um, exercises, so prescribing exercises really targeted to what ranges of motion those patients have lost, what strength, what muscle strength they have lost, which muscle strength they have lost, what coordination balance will really benefit those patients to maintain that joint and give that joint a little bit of a more functionality sometimes and that is still very debated whether it will actually prolong the life of that joint but we certainly see improvement in function in pain and in quality of life as a result and and how do you feel about um isolation machines versus functional movement so um, for example, one of the classic machines in a gym would be a leg extension where you sit in the chair and then bring your, bring your legs up towards you. Um, do they have any place at all? Um, or would you want it to replicate more um, upright, functional, um, managing load? Um, because a lot of trainers, if they get somebody comes in the gym who may, let's just say, have knee arthritis, they may want them, they may go to a leg extension machine or a leg curl machine. So you get that flexion extension at the knee. Would you say that's a good thing, bad thing, or um, would you much rather have them upright and on their feet? I think that's that it's 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 good and but it needs to be incorporated with some kind of progression. So if you're getting a, um, a patient with a joint which is which has got degenerative cartilage, so it's not functioning well and it's losing range of motion and it's losing its muscle strength, putting them on the machine to restore that pure protein level in the muscle so they can get stronger, that muscle hypertrophy, it's important. But you need to then think about it. How do you going to improve their function? So because those patients, they need to be able to use this muscle strength to sit, to stand, to walk the stairs, to reach down to the cupboard, to maybe go for a little hike go for a walk and those are all functional things so then once you've improved the strength of that muscle it's important to reteach that muscle to be incorporated into the muscle synergy or myofascia synergy into functional movement to add to improve coordination balance recruitment of that muscle so that's why just giving patients a pure um, um, leg strengthening exercises being it on adductor or abductor machines or extension flexion might not be just sufficient to um, to restore the function of that joint so that needs to be followed with a simple program of of but all graded to the patient level of function and ability to perform those movements with no pain using like squats, like lunges, like step ups and step down with different feet position, different position of the upper body because thoracic function or, or um, 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 thoracic cage function is important. So, you, and if you add those together, then you can make, um, you can then start moving patient and you will see the improvement. And on a basis of that exercises, people can go home and just repeat them. Mm. And it's quite easy to repeat things which are done in a sequential manner, just as if you imagine standing in the middle of the clock. Yeah. And would there be anything which would be a categorical no, avoid that? And I do appreciate people have different levels of um, you know, pain and different stages of arthritis. But what would you what would, would there be any exercises which if you heard someone was doing in the gym, you would be like, um, no, I would like you to avoid them because trying to push through would be counterproductive. So using heavy um, 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 heavy weights, loading the joints um, can be um, um, counterproductive because if you think about it, that cartridge is designed to shock absorb, to cushion the joint, to shock absorb. And suddenly you're losing that a bit of that shock absorbent ability. And so the load is being, uh, and we now know from studies as well, that underlying bone is very much involved in that whole osteoarthritic process. And we are now suspecting that maybe that what could be driving some of the osteoarthritis. So if you overload that joint, and God forbid if patients experience pain doing that, that can actually lead to more inflammation and 
less and people literally withdrawing um, from doing any activities. And as you know, uh, Chris, that once people have pain when they do exercises, they think that exercise is bad for you. They very seldom think that you just need to do it gradually and start from a different level. And then they think, okay, all the all the strengthening exercises are not good. So, so there is also a huge psychological um, element, a process which you need to be sure that pe people are doing things which are not hurting them because that gives them encourage and builds their self-esteem, self-efficacy rather than so. To answer in short, yeah, heavy loading is not um, advised. And obviously, if you are, if any of them, um, 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 people who work with uh, arthritis are trained to do exercises in water, that is a very good medium to combine with your floor and functional exercises or machine floor and functional exercises. And uh, but another thing which is important to avoid is any movement which causes pain. So, and with pain comes how many repetitions? So you might be able to do your first five repetitions, even with a heavier weight, with no problem but the next two sets may be causing more problems. So by the end of the day, patients will maybe end up with a bit of a discomfort and then the symptoms will um, flare up um, like in the evening. So that you need to, one needs to be aware of that and what can be tolerated by that patient. So starting with a smaller weight with maybe just a supportive um, gym machines and then just functional movement like round just squats without an, ever, ever, an, any overload may be a better option. But the other things which I just need to stress before we go on is that sometimes it's very important with patients with osteoarthritis to address the stability of the joint. Mm -hmm. And stability not only in one plane, so not only trying to make them to be stable in one particular movement, but so maybe sometimes starting from um, exercises which improve the stability. So that isometric recruitment of muscle before they perform the movement. And that's quite important as well. Yeah, because a lot of people may assume that, yeah, they have to do some form of a lunge or squat or, or hip hinge, when in reality, just being able to hold yourself in space in a controlled environment actually can be very challenging um, to begin with. So it's, it's very good that you've, that you've touched on that and um, going back to what you're saying about psychosomatic side of things communication and, and confidence and this is one of the purpose behind this podcast is being able to give um personal trainers and therapists a reference point um in terms of like how to deal with oa patients obviously there's going to be the psychosomatic factors of fear of um maybe like learned helplessness like they feel like there's nothing that they can do um, are, are we always on that point where it's very important to communicate that there is always potential of a flare up and it's not necessarily a bad thing because then we're learning tolerance? Is there any methods or, or things that you think is important to stress to the patient or client uh, prior that there is a, a, a possibility that they may get some flare ups at the early stages? So education at the moment is one of the first ports of call with management of osteoarthritis. So your, your big organization, which actually are involved in researching and recommending um, a management strategy for osteoarthritis, like American College of Sports Medicine or, or RC or NHS or EULA, um, which is the European um, equivalent, um, they do all recommend that education is the first thing. So with education, you do need to um, explain to patients the possibility of a flare up. And very often with something which is changing on a molecular level, on a cellular level, um, those flare up can come from no reason, really. Or people are not aware for the reason and they think, oh, it's it's something. But so explanation of that, in a way, progression of that condition and the fact that people withdraw from movement. So they become hypokinetic and they become fear. They have fear of movement. It's important. And explaining to them of that concept of mechanotransduction that movement is important, it's really essential part of dealing with those clients. Because once people understand that and you can overcome their fear with developing program, which is very gradual and oscillate between that um, gym based machine exercises where the joints are not stressed and floor exercises, maybe just 
the thing which gives patients the confidence and deal with that um, fear and worry which comes with osteoarthritis, being diagnosed of having osteoarthritis. The other things which maybe is also quite important, and this is what maybe when we have met each other and I've emphasized that when you're using gait, and we haven't mentioned that yet, but when you're using methods of joint movement analysis, which are fairly objective, or certainly are not so biased by what um, by your measurement, but you're just looking at, the, observing the gait, you're getting a much more objective view of what they're missing in a way of range of motions, and then possibly in a way of muscle strength. So then you are, and you, you can tweak the gait and look what additional movement of the gait. So like tweaking, so they, leg with, uh, they walk with the leg slightly out or maybe in or something like that. It will change the way they weight bear. And suddenly you can see that maybe improving that strength of that particular muscle, which has been involved in abduction of the hip joint or improving range of motions in the ankle joint will change the way they weight bear on that joint are that arthritic joints and it's very objective way and it it may it's then you are targeting the areas which are weak mm. caused by that osteoarthritis and not the area of the joint which you're dealing with but also the adaptation in the body mm. and then you're giving yourself a more chances of um of being much more successful in your in in the exercise program which you design for that patient mm. so based based on what you're saying is that much more um, applicable exercise selections rather than again squats and lunges to um to a degree would actually be um just variation in walking patterns with maybe different implements or different cues which then give the joint variety in some way yes and then you can you can use the same exercise you can then use those findings from the gate mm -hmm. When you cueing them to different uh, different movement patterns, you can then transfer that into designing the lunging and squat program. Yes, using different feet position, mm -hmm. different um, upper body position, yeah. and that will and um, and different um, um, different direct different length of reaching. Mm -hmm. For example, if you're doing lunges with reaches different length of how far you lunge and things like that. And then you can target specific deficits. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming back, sorry, um, coming back to psychosocial things, you then give people a purpose for doing exercises. Because mm -hmm. remember that with osteoarthritis, very often there is an element of discouragement because the generally people think that if I am diagnosed with osteoarthritis, the only thing is to wait till it de deteriorates and I have a replacement. Whereas if you, if you give them purpose and you 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 um, um, you also justify that and you explain to them, you video their gait and then you show them, you analyze that, people find that very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And also, just uh, at the moment, a lot of clinical evidence, maybe not yet fully backed up with research, but the research is growing, that using those specific deficits may give you a more chance of being very successful in making those joints much more functional. And um, so just to touch back on, on what you're saying about yep. the walking, just from more of an applicable point of view, when somebody's walking and you make a modification, so let's just say this person has right hip or um, osteoarthritis, and you say walk with your left, with your right foot turned out, giving them a little bit more external rotation or whichever, um, and they say that reduces the pain, and then you get them to move with their foot inwards and that increases the pain. Would you be, um, would you want to encourage movements which reduce the pain or would you be wanting to encourage movements that actually increase the pain so they have the capacity to access that position? So you that gives you that difference between external and internal rotation in the hips. It gives you a pointing, it gives you a point of start. Mm -hmm. So if, because remember that, as we said, from more of that psychosocial um, and also the pain science, we don't want patients to feel pain mm -hmm. because with, if, if a patient is diagnosed with osteoarthritis and then they move and they feel pain, that's a very discouraging thing. So that gives you a point of start and they comfort for that joint. Mm -hmm. 
So that's when you can start working on them um, and slowly move them into the areas where there is restriction. But with that, you also need to analyze is it because they've lost the range of motions because of the deterioration of the joint and, and the adaptation in a soft tissue around the joint? Have they lost the strength? Have they lost the strength to, um, in, um, to bring that um, leg into internal rotation? And what you need to address first? So do you need to target range of motions, flexibility? Do you need to target strength? Do you need to target coordination? Because maybe they don't have the coordination. So, and a balance. And that's why they will avoid the movement because they brain, what they, what they perceive and how they interpret that perception is telling them, I don't want to go in that internal rotation direction. So there is all sorts of things which you can tackle that. You know, we know that if a patient has got osteoarthritis and had experienced pain in the joint with osteoarthritis, they stop moving that joint and that leads to um, atrophy of the muscles and loss of range of motion. So what do you address first? And that tells you that and when you actually tweak them and cue them to different um, a different position of the joint, like if you took example of internal and external rotation of the hip, okay? So staying on the aspect of, um, or like a little bit psychosocial in terms of explanation, but this is more from your clinical experience, from a observation or um, both visual and when people are giving you feedback, if someone's undiagnosed with osteoarthritis, what are you seeing and hearing which would make you think this person possibly needs an x-ray or this person may be um, at the onset of, of OA? Right. So if you if you're suspecting, so basically you're saying that you as a therapist or as a, a fitness instructor, a trainer, you you're looking at the joint and you think that joint is possibly not performing the function was designed for. So it's stiffer. OK. And 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 so you, you you're looking at the age of the patient, because that's another very important factors which we haven't yet discussed of of which group are more prone to osteoarthritis and things like that. And you suspect so. You need to think about um, really, uh, because if 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 within your scope of practice you can possibly um, suggest that they might have somewhere and tear, then you obviously that's permissible. But if not, then you need to maybe encourage them to call, to contact their doctors and um, and for some kind of imaging. But at the same time. You need to be fully aware that if they come back and they have a bit of wear and tear, and we now know that movement and encouraging them to, to move, to strengthen, to regain its function is the most, it's very important. So you need to weigh up, weigh up whether them finding out the extent of the generation and what impact will have on them. So education is important. So with that advice of sending them back to a doctor, really giving them sources where they can find out more about it will be useful. Obviously, if you have not even suggested, then maybe later on when they come back with some x-rays and diagnosis of osteoarthritis, giving them education, which will make them less scared and more encouraged to do movement, is very important from that psychological and motivational aspect. Because mm. will, will the first thing that people who get that diagnosis think is like it's not necessarily a death sentence, but it's the beginning of a, of a negative cascade? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But if you think that that negative cascade can present itself with certain points of physiological decline. So one of the very first points we know could be loss of stability. Mm -hmm. If we can work on stability and on some restoration of range of motions, that could be enough to reduce that possibility of flare up and pain. And it will also address that people fear and also fear of movement. And, and with that will come um, the fact that the impact of osteoarthritis may be as not so overwhelming and people will learn to live with it and exercise with it and move with it and use movement as their medicine, basically. And what if it's the other way? What if it, What if they're actually very, very active? So what if it's somebody who is you know, over the age of 60, but they're very 
um they're very very active they do a lot of walking and and they, and they uh, and then they come across it or they get diagnosed with it because they'll probably argue well i'm active anyway i am loading it is there a different approach or is it just you have to specify the exercises a bit more so in some ways you're looking at one person a, a person like this because i am i've got quite severe as you know arthritis in my left hip and my right knee and in the spine mm. so for that, those group of patients being using gait analysis to dis, to really look what is beginning not to, um, which bit of the range of motions they're losing in the joint affected by arthritis. And then looking that globally, how that joint affect the function of the rest of the body, designing a program, paying attention to flare ups where they have to withdraw from that maybe quite intensive activities encouraging them to use those moments of where the joint is maybe a little bit stressed to go to water, to take a bit of a pressure. So look, doing a sort of a more global approach, it's possibly very important. And it certainly um, will, will maintain the function of that joint. Because with those patients, you don't have possibly a difficulty or those group of population encouraging them to move. But they need to do what we, what I call the smart moves, mm -hmm. and that's why finding out methods of how you can assess them is very important. Yeah, and and finally, from a from a treatment point of view, because I know this is more about the training side, um, and we well, obviously we've we've worked in in clinic, and you've you've tutored me through clinic through multiple people with OA who have associated tendinopathies, bursitis, and and so forth, um. Where do you go from a, you know, if a client says, or your client says to you, do I just need a massage? Do I need treatment? Um, because as I, I've had it before in the past where I've had people with this and you 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 want to help the range of motion, but then the range of motion, you give them too much range of motion and then you've made them less stable, which can actually increase the flare up. Um, again, I know it's individual, individual specific, but is there anything that you'd be recommending from a therapy point of view that would complement the, um, the training? So definitely addressing the myofascia um, tissue flexibility via massage, via myofascia release, via active release. Um, it's very important because without a doubt, if um, a joint is being it's losing a little bit of cartilage, is losing its function, then the surrounding muscles will, will develop element of protection, which might present as a stiffness, which then secondarily stresses that joint. So addressing that um, myofascia tissue flexibility is important. Whether you do that through a specific soft tissue treatment or whether massage, of course, if you if you choose to go to a therapist who were trained, like osteopaths, physiotherapists, chiropractors, understanding MSK injuries, then obviously you're getting a little bit of a more of a um, 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 deluxe treatment. But if you if you choose to go back to your own massage therapist, or if a thera if a fitness instructor is using massage um, therapy techniques, addressing some of those muscle stiffness will reduce. But stress on the joint, but I always find, Chris, and that's what I've taught you, and this is part of what I, that you really do need to combine training, so good um, assessment, myofascia, soft tissue osteopathic, because we are both osteopath techniques, with then good exercise, individualized, not good, individualized exercise therapy. And I found that that being the most effective way of, of maintaining those joints functioning for years, and maybe slowing down the progression to a full-blown deterioration.